Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is your boy, Jay Mason. Welcome back to another episode of Beyond the Album Cover, where we get inside the entertainment industry with those in the know and give them their flowers while they're here to be celebrated. With me, I have a fellow friend from the 252. And if you know about the 252, it's all about sticks, trees, dirt. But we have a strong love of music, family, and community. So I got my bro, DJ J. Rich, in the building. J. Rich. What's good, everybody? What's good? Man, I appreciate thank you, thank you taking you the time it. to come on the podcast, man. Yes, sir. The thing is, is that we're both from the same whole area how we were talking before this interview and how you went to a rival high school of mine, even though we never really played each other <laughs> except for the exhibition seasons, but Northwest trash, the band trash. North Atlanta County High School West. Ah, even though, go, even though we don't exist no more, we we, we still got it. <laughs> Shout out to all my fellow Hurricane alums. Kane's <laughs> Funk, you know. Viking Pride, baby, all day and forever. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, the proof's in the pudding. So um, let's go ahead and jump right into it, bro. So tell the people, how did you get your start in DJing and what made you fall in love with music? Well, I started... Let's start from the beginning. I fell in love with music at an early age. Um, when I was growing up, my parents listened to a lot of gospel and a lot of soul records like um, Al Green, Gap Band, um, pop records like Michael Jackson and Prince. They actually had the vinyls, uh, 33 and a half and 45 RPMs, even some of the singles. Um, and honestly, a lot of Southern soul too, like Roy C., um, you know, stuff along that lines. Uh, let me see. Royce, Tyrone Davis, um, Ray Charles, people in that era. So I pretty much grew up off of um, a lot of disco and Southern Soul music. Right. And for those that don't know, Southern Soul it is a genre of music, which is very big in the Southern United States, pretty much from the Carolinas down to about Texas. Maybe further north is Virginia. But if you're in those pockets of those states, you can make a comfortable living doing Southern Soul shows. Yes. Right now, the top uh, artist I want to say is King George, and he's doing very well, especially for a Southern Soul album that doesn't even have a complete album out yet. Wow, that's def definitely crazy. <laughs> and with our area of North Carolina, it was very vital back during the days of segregation when they had the Chitlin Circuit. So I remember hearing yeah. from a lot of the older folks around our area, they were saying that a lot of the top tier black acts in the 60s would come through the Reno Valley and perform. And some would stay at the old New Yorker Hotel, which was over in Weldon. Yep, off of 301. That's right. Mm -hmm, which I believe are now refurbished apartments. And, you know, our area pretty much has a lot of strong ties within the music industry, you know, North Carolina, period, from from Coltrane to Jodeci, Fantasia, Anthony Hamilton, J. Cole, Petey Pablo, Little Brother, Petey, Mr. Cheeks Rhapsody out of Snow Hill, so what is it about our state, in your opinion, that makes it fertile for a lot of those musicians to come out and really succeed? I honestly think it's that the majority of the North Carolina ones that have come out, they stay humble when they go into the game. Um, they don't try to let the success get to their heads to make them, in a sense, like where they're bigger, but they or they feel like they're bigger than the other artists that's in there that are pretty much superior, they could be superior to them, whether it's music sales or uh, I would want to say like collaborating or knowing other celebrity stars outside of where they might be able to grasp to. Um, because from what I hear, like a lot of the people like Petey Pablo and Mr. Cheeks and Rhapsody, they're pretty uh, nice one. They're pretty approachable people. Right. And speaking of little brother, did you happen to catch the documentary that just dropped uh, last Friday? Made a little watch. I did not. I'm going to try to catch it sometime tomorrow, hopefully. Yeah, it's a dope After documentary. Parade. Dope documentaries on little brother's official YouTube page is with Fonte, rapper Big Pool. And you get to just hear about the origin stories of little brother, where they are now and how they've grown since their debut back in 03 with the listening, because I can remember me being a freshman at UNCG in 2004 and bumping the listening a lot on my college show and just hearing it and like, okay, 
These guys <laughs> are definitely the offspring of what came before them with the Native Tongues movement with De La Soul, Tribe Called Quest, Black Sheep, and they followed that lineage. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I remember because I was a sophomore when they dropped, um, you said in 03, so I was definitely a sophomore. And I remember coming up in school, it was them, and it was another group called Kids in the Hall. And I think... I could be wrong, but I believe Lou Pay was getting some mm, like minor acknowledgement at that time, but he wasn't getting like well known until like oh five oh six, I believe. Mm -hmm. Right, and I should also mention too, coming from the two five two area in the music business, doing her thing. Brooke Simpson, I believe, was her name. Um, yes, she, she yes. The voice a couple years ago from Hollister. Yes, yes. Yep, I know Brooks family very well. Um, Brooks, I want to say probably like seven or eight years younger than me, so I didn't really grow up with her in a sense. Um, but I know her, but her parents and my parents are real good friends. Right, they went to school of, together. So right, right out of Hollister, North Carolina. Now, yeah, amazing getting, talent, amazing, yeah, amazing talent, talent, amazing voice. Yeah, because when I first saw her on there, I was like, Hollister, North Carolina, like, oh, she from around the way. Right. <laughs> yeah, so that was like, hey, it's a, it's a small world. So who is the one artist that you listened to growing up that made you say, I want to go ahead and invest myself and become a DJ? Well, here's the thing. There was no really particular artist. What ended up happening was when I started high school, um, but I want to say er actually early middle school, eighth grade-ish, um, you were able to download music from Napster. So I was one of the few people in the area that were like, hey, you know, I think I'm going to do a little something with this. And at the time, you know, you could make your mixtapes and sell them like you wanted to. So I would, I, and I had a small DJ program that was on the computer. So at that time, I was making my own mixtapes. Um, I would get, as you know, back at that time in middle school, I want to say that was 2000, 2001. So that was around the Jay-Z DMX Juvenile was hot at the time. Um, you had some Trick Daddy coming out. I think Tank was hot at the time. So I was doing a lot of um, R&B tapes and then rap tapes as well. Right. So the mixtape hustle game was strong in the halls of Northwest too, I believe. Yes. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, I want to say it was me and I want to say maybe two or three other guys that were involved that, um, that did it. So um, definitely worked out in that favor, but I had always wanted to become a DJ. Um, but in a sense, the only issue I had was a lot of the DJs that I knew were older and they weren't uh, in our area anymore. Mm -hmm. They had like, they had pretty much like moved away from the Hollister area. Um, so if people in the Hollister or Littleton area were getting a DJ, it wasn't somebody that was in the area. They were maybe from like Virginia or maybe like the Raleigh Rocky Mount area. And they were coming out with the turntables at the time, you know, around that time there were no controllers. I think you had turntables or you had to have CDJs. Mm -hmm. Oh man, the good old days with CDJs and before digital and Serato, where DJs man. you actually had to have a literal crew so that you could be able to set up, break down equipment, bring in the record crates, and you have somebody that would go through the crates and DJs the record. And that was pretty much how a lot of the big name DJs got their apprenticeship in the game, which they would kind of be affiliated with a crew and start off carrying mm -hmm. crates and then build their rep from there. Exactly. Right. So you're from the Littleton Hollister area, right? Yes, sir. From around, yeah. So being from around that way, you know, that's Lake Gaston, Car Lake area. Were there any big events that you would go to that really sparked your love of music in and around that area or to say Henderson, Raleigh, Durham? Okay. So around that time, like I said, this is back in my years and I was in my 20s. So in early teenage years too. Um, the downtown turnaround, what they have in Littleton, um, I do not recall strongly if they had a band, I mean a DJ at the time, but I knew they used to have live bands. Uh, I think every now and then they would have somebody come and do DJ music on maybe, mm -hmm. maybe like Friday nights or on Saturday mornings. Um, and then in the Hollister area, uh, a lot of people have like birthday parties, but we would have like the um Every year we had powwow, powwow weekends, usually like the third weekend of April to celebrate the uh, Native American culture. Um, 
one of the local guys from there, he was in the military, but he would always come down because he stayed out of state. And he would always come down and um, DJ the after parties during those events. Okay. And that's what yeah. the Hobos, the Pony Tribe, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Shout out to DJ T Nice. All right. Yeah, definitely. Shout out. I didn't really make my way out to Lilton too, too much. The only time I kind of passed through was when trying to hit on 85 to get back to Greensboro, pass through Lilton, Macon, North Carolina. Around that area yeah. before hitting on 85, getting back to Greensboro. So, growing up for you, what was that one radio station that you listened to which really caught your attention? Well, um, right now it's 99.5, but when I was a kid, the top radio station that we could really get in the area was either 104.3 or 92.1, which was uh, based out of Rocky Mountain, I believe. Yep. And I think so, so 92.1. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's the radio station for those that don't know where Terrence J got to start because Terrence J is exactly. from Rocky Mount. Yep. That's exactly right. Yeah, and sure. I don't even, I don't know if it get airwaves now because I know 95.5 picks up a lot more now. 99.5 does as well. But during that time, it was definitely 92.1. Yeah, shout out to Soul 92.1. Shout out to my man, D-Train. You know, I used to be a- Shout out D-Train. D-Train <laughs> uh, at 99.5 Jams, and he would tell the stories how Terrence J used to just come up to the studio and just really hang around and then end up getting on and everything that happened after that with 106 in Park and where he is now, and I think it all started in 252. Right. That's a small world, man, I tell you. <laughs> right, right. Because reading his book, I think he said that he also worked part time at the mall in Rocky Mount at Golden East, at probably at Foot Locker or Caymans. Now, if you know yeah. about Caymans, Caymans was that <laughs> one store where Ooh. if you were out in them streets making that you money, you were the only one that could afford that. Me, I just went in there to just look in window shop because I wanted <laughs> one of those Cheerios, Frosted Flakes. DuPont race car jacket so bad oh. just so I could stun on them at the Holiday Classic, but unfortunately know that's that never right. happened. Man, come on. Yeah, uh, Holiday Classic, I love that. Christmas tournament, you couldn't go wrong. Um, I would definitely go in Caymans, and um, I was always a rock baby, man. I strictly wore rock, rock wear. And I would go in and I would catch like the shirt or a hat on sale. You can get it for like 2 for 45 the hat and the shirt. Mm. That's all I needed. Right, and if you couldn't what make it to Caymans, you had Sugar Hill Fashion. Exactly. Yeah, that was exactly. that was the next best thing because um, for those that's not from the two five two area, around Christmas time every year, they would have a basketball tournament, which was formerly North Indian County High School West, my alma mater, which is now North Indian County High, where all of the local schools in the area they would compete in a basketball tournament. And by the time you got to the nightcap game around seven, it would be standing room only depending on who would play. Because I can remember growing up, going to those games that whenever it would be Brunswick County versus whoever, it was going to be standing room only. Because this was right around the time when they had Darius Hargrove and a lot of the other big names that came out of there. Um, the biggest name that came out of Brunswick County High was Byron Stiff, who ended up playing college ball at UVA and ended up mm -hmm. playing for years in the NBA, primarily with the Denver Nuggets. Yes, that's exactly right. And right. Um, from the from our area, I think the only basketball player we really had go pro was uh, Delaney Rudd. He was from the Hollister area as well. Yeah, He, he played for the Utah to, Jazz back in the early 90s. Yeah, I believe he went to Eastman. This was back when Eastman was a high school because when I was growing up, Eastman was a middle school. And exactly. then now most recently in the league, you got Kent Baysmore in the league. Yep. He's out of He's Bertie, Bertie County. County too, right? And yeah, from Bertie County. And then also Keldon Johnson from the 434 uh, went yes. to Parkview for a good minute playing for the San Antonio Spurs. That's right. Yep, so we got some homegrown talent coming up. Coming up. Yep. Yeah, so that's def definitely good to see that, you, you know, our area of North Carolina and South South Virginia putting out product. Now, yeah. being with your age range, who was the first hip-hop artist that really captured your attention? The Jigga Man, Jay-Z. 
when I was a kid, uh, let me see. I'm trying to remember when Reasonable Doubt came out. I think it was maybe 95, 96. Yeah, around that time frame, 95, 96. So the first record I heard, because my uncle, my dad and all my uncles were big on music, but they all listen to like different genres. And my mm -hmm. uncle is literally 20 years older than me, but he would always listen to, he always listened to rap. Mm -hmm. So he would listen to like the LL Cool J's, your Slick Ricks, uh, Big Daddy Kane, KRS-One. Um, a lot of it at the time, and he was big on Tupac at the time. And I remember dri riding with him in his Nova, and I heard this guy that had this unique sounding voice. And it was the, uh, the record with Jay-Z and Foxy Brown. Um, so when I heard it, I was like, I like the way his voice sounds when he raps. That really is what drew me to being a fan of Jay-Z. Uh, fast forward, my reason that was actually my first album that I ever purchased outside of Michael Jackson's history. Um, I got the cassette tape from Camelot Music. I was about to ask. I was about to say, and, you went to Camelot at Becca Village, didn't you? Yeah, at Becca Village Mall. <laughs> Ooh, I, I remember them time, days. Mm -hmm. And at that time, if you did not have a parent with you, you could, they would only sell you the clean version of the um, cassette. And it just so happened, they only had two copies of that in. And I was able to grab one of those cassettes, and I still have it at my parents' house to this day. Yeah, I never knew that about Camelot, that they wouldn't sell you the dirty version of an album unless you had the parent present, because I can remember you had to go to either. I think you had to be a teenager, too, though. But like I said, I was like 9 or 10 when that album came out, I believe, so yeah. um, that was why. <laughs> yeah, 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 so you had to go to your big box stores to get the clean versions of the album. Kids don't understand that you had to get a clean edit of the album and then most stores they would keep their dirty stuff in the back or yeah. they would have to be a certain age in order to purchase those explicit albums now I don't know if you know this about Reasonable Doubt that there's an NC connection with that album that the producer on majority of the tracks on Reasonable Doubt was Ski Beats and do you know who yes. Ski Beats is? Yes, I've always been a fan of Ski Yep, and you know he's from he's from NC around uh, Greensboro. Yeah. Yep, yep. Got to start with Busy Boys and end up producing for Camp Low, Jay Z, various mm -hmm. other hip hop artists. And I can remember um, there was a group called Now City, and they had this joint called uh, Hot Right. I mean, right now, and I think the artist's name was Hot Right, and mm -hmm. it was a record that. Ended up getting massive airplay on K97.5 and then on 102 Jams out in the triad area. And mm -hmm. how they mentioned Ski Beats, I believe he produced the record for Now City. And mm -hmm. I remember they came down for a talent show at Davie, Wilmar Davie Middle School. And that when they performed that record, everybody was just like, oh, just, just really hyped and just really excited about it because, you know, this yeah. was before our. Yeah, definitely before, right around when Reason. Pablo came out with a uh, Raise Up, because I was a freshman in high school when Raise Up came out. That was like 2000, 2001. And yeah. the Now City record preceded it by maybe three to four years or so. But I say that to say that when that record hit, it pretty much exploded and it really gave those of us from NC a sense of pride because. Yeah. Prior to that, you never really had anybody on the rap side coming out and really doing their thing. Of course, R&B was steadily moving, you know, with Jodeci being now. This was before Anthony Hamilton really came onto the scene. But, you know, that record by Now City was like gangbusters. Yeah. I'm going to have to go back and listen to that record now. Right. Man, and you then, said that. <laughs> right. And then uh you know of the record Shorty Swing My Way by KP and Envy. Yeah, KP and Envy. And I believe uh Envy is from the Weldon area. Yeah, she's from Weldon. So actually, yeah. funny story. So when I was in uh, sixth grade at Gaston Middle School, she actually came and performed. And this was right around the time when that record was blowing up, and she had mentioned that she was going to put out an album. I don't know if the album ever came out or whatever came of it. But it was just the fact that everybody was looking at BET and seeing Soul Train like, oh, she's she from around the way. And I remember seeing yeah. her one year at the 
Christmas tournament, and my boy was trying to get me to say hey to her. I, I was like, nervous, man. <laughs> playing shot brother like five heartbeats and, and right. she uh, was like hey back and i'm like oh okay okay she you know because you know I, yeah so that was definitely dope you know seeing her from weldon being out and doing her thing and on the r&b side who is the your r&b artist that when you first heard them or saw them on tv really wowed you and impressed you Definitely Michael Jackson, man. Definitely Michael. Um, as a kid, when you I was seeing pop up on TV, um, I was always a big fan. I was trying to sing the songs and do the dance moves, and I had the glove and the hat and jacket, and and my grandfather actually gifted me. He had one of the red uh, MJ jackets with the zippers on it, the leather ones, and mm -hmm. uh, he actually gifted me that as a kid, and I still have that to this day. So it's definitely Michael. Yeah, and. Funny how you mentioned the King of Pop that as of the recording of this podcast that officially out on Paramount Plus Showtime, we have the documentary Thriller 40, how this year is the 40th anniversary of the cultural landmark watershed music industry album for Thriller. And that album pretty much saved the music industry when you take a look yes. at it because record sales were down and... It made a whole lot of people a whole lot of money. So can we just talk about, from your perspective, the impact of Thriller, not only as a sonic soundscape in music, but a cultural worldwide phenomenon that we won't see again? Well, for one, we know we won't see it again because, um, and I try to have this conversation with a lot of my friends that, that chit chat with me about music. Um, you know, streaming is different from buying albums, you know, you, you get it, you put it on your phone, and we're in a time now where it's like, okay, I'm going to listen to it for a little while, and I'm on to the next. But at that time, albums were really special. And if you, and if some, nobody would purchase your album unless they really, really liked you. And you had to put out quality music for it to actually go as far as Thriller has came. Uh, what, what are we on, what, 38 million records sold? Is is definitely with, within that ballpark, or if not, and I more. believe he's gonna hit forty. I believe he's gonna hit forty. Yeah, definitely um, not, not more, man. But think about it though: forty years and how, you know, Quincy Jones, the late Rod Temperton, uh, Greg yes. Filling Gaines, a lot of those musicians, producers put together a quality album that we're still loving and singing and listening to forty years later. Man, and it, it's crazy because I don't really know if there's even an argument for it to not even to be the greatest album of all time. And to think that the official version really only has nine records. So in today's world, it would actually be an EP. It would even be considered a full album. Right. But a strong <laughs> nine, though. You're right. It's a strong nine. Yeah, that's that's the thing, though, because a lot of those acts and the producers took their time in making those records and they weren't rushing. And I can remember when Jam and Lewis, when they first got with Janet Jackson after she put out her first two albums, which were mm, mediocre. But yeah. once they put together Control, they figured out, like, hey, we got to get her out of the hair of Papa Joe right. and mm -hmm. the camp so that we can really formulate an album that's tailored to her. And the proof is in yes. the pudding with, with that one. It definitely. It definitely was. And that album was amazing as well. Um, and going back to Thriller, man, like, if you sit back and just, if you go and listen to even the demo songs, you can see why it was kind of cut down to nine, but even the demo songs were, would have been so strong had they finished those and even put those on the album. Right. And yeah. and Starlight, I believe the song is called Starlight. That was the original song that was supposed to be Thriller until they went back and decided to do an entirely different idea and concept for the album. Yeah, I definitely heard about that and how Michael was motivated to put out an album that was going to be an across the board success because while Off the Wall was a success, it was only regulated as a black album. That was what they called yes. R&B records at the time. And how he wanted a record that was going to appeal to 
all genres and not just be stuck in a box. Mm -hmm. And that's one album that definitely does. I think since then, unless I can go back and listen to a Prince album that does it all the way through, I think the last album that actually touched all genres and all uh, cultures is probably Bruno Mars' 24 Carat album. Right. And when you think about that record, to me, that's a love letter to 90s R&B with yes. Ness and Versace on the floor. I was like, Bruno definitely studied albums from the New Jack Swing era, like Guy, Don't Be Cruel, Make mm -hmm. It Last Forever, that whole time period. Yes. And then touch back in too, because then you got some records like Perm that kind of put you in like the soul era, like you like some of your James Brown's records. Mm -hmm. Right. And then Uptown with the Punk. Heavy, with the heavy trumpets all over the record and the loud um uh, I don't want to say loudness, but the strong pronunciation of words when he's singing over that record. Mm -hmm. And then if you listen to Uptown Funk, it's definitely pretty much a tribute to the Minneapolis sound with Morris Day and yeah. the Time. And then the most recent work that he did with Anderson Pack, a Silk Sonic, <laughs> Love Letter to 70 Soul. Definitely. Love it. Shout out to Anderson too, man, because uh, I love how Anderson took his voice and made it a an instrument. Right. He Because he, when you hear him rap or talk, you would never expect him to come out and actually sing on records. And he mm -hmm. made it work. Him and Bruno doing Silk Sonic. Right. And Thanks. speaking of Bruno, I believe one of his musicians is from Wilson. I didn't know that. Is yeah. it the guitar? Is it the guitar player? Um, I think it is. Um, he's from uh Wilson. Okay, I knew I thought I remember somebody telling me he had a guitar player from North Carolina, but I didn't know it was from Wilson. Man, that's yeah. right up the street. Yeah, yeah. He 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 from Wilson. I think he went to um I want to say Bedenfield. Benefield, okay. High, Benefield High School out of um, out of Wilson. Wilson. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And then also too, being in the two five two area, I'm sure you probably know about that great basketball pipeline that comes out of Kinston. Yes. Yep. Kinston, North Carolina. We had Cedric Cornbread, Maxwell, Jerry Stackhouse, um, Brandon Ingram, Brandon Ingram, Bi, and then from Goldsboro, you have Kobe White. Uh, Jimmy mm -hmm. Graham out of Goldsboro yep. and you know like I said just I'm just glad that with our side of the state 252 is finally getting looked at in recognition for its talent and athletics too because you, yeah. when you think of athletics you're thinking about everything that's coming out of 919 which is Raleigh Durham 704 yeah. Charlotte area Charlotte. And 336 Triad Greensboro once it's seven high point and the 252 mm -hmm. area is kind of like a Stopover, and I can't forget we got um Bam out of Bio from Little Washington, and then of course yeah. the human highlight film Dominique Wilkins from Little Washington. Yeah, yeah, definitely from Little Washington. I didn't know Bam was from Little Washington though. Wow. Yeah, you learn know, something he, new every day. Yeah, I think he ended up um going to going to school out there for for a good minute, but but yeah, Bam uh went to um yes yeah, from L Little Washington, and then of course you got oh, your usual okay. suspects like your your John Walls from out of Raleigh Durham, yeah, out of Raleigh, three Greensboro, Steph, Charlotte, Seth, Charlotte, Steph, Charlotte, <laughs> and uh, you know the the list just just goes on, goes on and on, on man. man. So I want to talk about right here. Have you seen the documentary "The Choice Is Yours"? It's about dress from the group Black Sheep. And about how he got the last recorded beats that Jay Dilla did before he passed. I did not. Yeah, it's on Paramount Plus, but I'm bringing it up because um, when I was looking at the documentary, a little bit of a not a big spoiler, but just that um, Drez has NC ties that originally his folks are from Sanford, North Carolina, wow. out of Lee County. And then they end up relocating to NY, which is typical for a lot of the cases being in the South, especially during that great migration period where a lot of yeah. folks from the South would migrate either to the West Coast, Midwest, or up North. But a lot of them have Southern yeah. roots. I did not know that at all. That's amazing. 
Yeah, definitely amazing when you think about how, you know, a lot of folks say, oh, I got family in North Carolina, I got family in Virginia, you know, because I'm sure you probably know that a lot of folks who had kids in the city, they would come down to the country for the summer, spend it with their relatives, and then mm -hmm. go back up north when it was time to go to school. So they definitely got that southern way of living for the summer when they would go back up north or to wherever big city they were from. That's right. Yep. Right. And I can also remember I always too, come from the city to the country for the summer. <laughs> right. And I can also remember too, that's when the mixtape game really got heavy down south because while for us it was brand new, but if you go to New York, DC, Philly, Atlanta, whatever, some of those mixtapes they had been out months in advance. But because this is pre-internet, or early internet where information was so readily available, it was to where it was brand new to us. Yes. Yeah, because yeah, definitely... going back to like you said when the mixtapes came down, because if I'm not mistaken, um, you asked me about a friend I knew, and that's really how I knew him through his dad, because mm. his dad was a DJ and um, he had the mixtapes as well. He would go up north, get the mixtapes, bring them back down, and do what it do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cause you could mark up them bad boys for maybe two, three times the price. Either um sell them at a uh, your local urban outfitter, or mm -hmm. if you know about the stockyards in Rocky Mountain. Yes, <laughs> that's where I would always go. And if it was one I could not get, I knew he would be home either Saturday night or Sunday morning with it. Right, the stockyards in Rocky Mountain. That's where you would go to. Get your stuff. Uh, some of it may be a little bit sus, but <laughs> you definitely went there to make sure that you got what you could get. So it's almost kind of like what you say the flea market is or how some people out West would call it the swap meet where they would yeah. go and they would have their wares. And of course, swap meets is where Dr. Dre pretty much had his early exposure with his mixtapes because he was DJing on the air on 1580 K Day before mm -hmm. NWA and of course he was in World Class Wrecking Crew and everything yeah. that Dr. Dre you know has became and you know when you think about that Super Bowl halftime show I believe it was, was it, no 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 I think it was last year when yeah, they had Dr. Dre, 22. Eminem, Snoop, 50, Mary J and yeah. how I never thought of being a six, seven-year-old kid when The Chronic came out and eight when Doggy Style came out that we will soon have a Super Bowl halftime show where you have a complete hip-hop show and seeing the dancers crip walking and the Super Bowl <laughs> halftime show. I'm like, whoo, man, listen. And to this day, it's still the best one I've seen, honestly. Yeah, de TV. definitely, definitely good halftime show. And it was a rarity, too, because 50 don't really rap now because he's making money off of that power universe. And yes. I don't I don't blame him. And if they ever do a Force Tour Part 2, if you had not been to the Force Tour, you got to go if they decide to do it again. I had a chance to go check it out when it came through Albuquerque. You had your living hip-hop legends, LL, Rakim... Bone Thugs, Big Boy. Um, I'm trying to think who else was there when I... Jazz Jeff was, of course, there. DJ Z Trip, LL's DJ. Roots with the backing band. And with it being hip-hop's 50th anniversary this year, it's good to see that for a lot of the higher-ups who look there on their nose upon hip hop and saying that it won't last. It'll be like disco and go away to where mm -hmm. corporations need to get embedded with hip hop because they realize yeah. that it is the conduit to getting this particular demographic and knowing that it's the most popular genre of music in the world. I mean, most countries that don't even speak English, they know a Drake record. Yes. Or a Biggie record, or mm -hmm. a Jay, mm -hmm. or Lil Wayne. You're right, and 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 it's, and it's crazy how, like going back to what you stated, they didn't think it was gonna last. They didn't think it was gonna be this universal. They thought 
people thought eventually it was going to revert back to, um, I want to say maybe soul and hard rock taking back over. And mm -hmm. to think that it's the, the biggest uh, genre of music in the world today is just amazing. Like, right. because nobody thought it was going to branch out this far and be this strong. Yeah, like Biggie said in Juicy, you never thought the hip hop would take it this far. I mean, far. the New York Library got the Book of Holes exhibit. Yes. I want to go to New York now just to see that. Yeah, it's definitely Strictly a beautiful <laughs> exhibit. Beautiful exhibit. Gail King had did a sit down with Jay Z at the Book of Holes exhibit. Yeah. He was just reflecting on his career from the beginnings to. Now, where Rock Nation is responsible for putting together the Super Bowl halftime show, then of course everything with Beyonce and her Renaissance tour, and to just see how Jay Z went from this to this to this. Yes. You can't see my hand if you're on Zoom, but he is I saw it. <laughs> a billionaire ten times over, and. Probably still spending money from 88, like you said, in dead presidents. Yes. Man. Yeah, so so what is your favorite Jay-Z record? Oh my God. You know, you really put me on the spot with this one. Um I'm gonna say I'm torn between feeling it with Mecca. Um I'm a big fan of imaginary players. Uh, uh, is it Moonlight from 444? Mm, mm, I think so, yeah. And I know. Okay. I would have can't, to say those are my four, but I can't really pick which one I like the best. Yeah, it can't go wrong with those records. I believe I Know was produced by Neptunes, right? Yes, yep, produced by the Neptunes. Right, and the crazy thing about the Neptunes is that, of course, them being from 757, which is the Tidewater area of Virginia, Norfolk, Hampton, Newport News, Portsmouth, Chesapeake, Hampton Roads area, yeah. and how for us, that area of Virginia was like a four-hour drive. But I can remember when Timberland, Missy, and all them came out, we were claiming them like, uh, oh, we, we, we claim them too because, you know, VA... That part of right. VA is <laughs> so close. I'm like, we we're not directly VA, but we're close enough drive. So so we'll so we'll claim them too. Yep, we definitely claim them. We claiming Missy, we claiming Timbo, we claiming Clips, uh, <laughs> yeah, Neptune, yeah, yeah Chris man. Brown. We claim them all. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, because I can remember when Grinding came out by the Clips. That fed every lunchroom, every yes. desk when there was a rap battle. So, hey, hey man, hit the grinding beat real quick. And that was me. I oh, was the I was the the table hitter. <laughs> oh, you were the one the doing, the, doing, doing, the the, doing the beats on the uh, on the cafeteria table. Yes, yeah, worry about why the rest of the guys around me uh spit. Mm, yeah, this was definitely back during the days when One Assistant Park had everybody in the chokehold like Draymond Green did, Rudy Gobert. When it was yes. a Freestyle Friday, it was appointment television. Appointment television. You could not miss it. You made sure to tune in for at least um, the second round in the top five on 106 and Park. Mm, yeah. In the basement, too? Rap City? Yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's a good documentary you got to check out. It's called Welcome to Rap City. It's a three-part documentary explaining the history of Rap City, and I had a chance to interview Alvin Jones, who was the unseen VJ on BET back in the day for Video Vibrations, and he was the co-creator of Rap City, and he was explaining to me how it started basically through Video Vibrations, which was a show that he was hosting in the EP for, and how they did a week dedicated to just rap. And it was one of the highest rated episodes of Video Vibrations. And that ended up turning the wheels with those at BET. Say, hey, let's put a show about rap on. And that's how we ended up coming up with Rap City. Cool, cool.
I'm gonna have to check that out. I didn't know you had, uh, had one of those. I'm gonna have to check it. Alvin Jones. That's right. Yeah, I'm Alvin Jones. Alvin Jones, the the unseen VJ, and you know, BT was definitely a vital network for getting Black culture exposed to a nationwide audience, and especially yeah. for those of us being from our neck of the woods. The only way I got to see it early on was. My grandma, she had that big old satellite dish outside. <laughs> and I remember turning to G5 Channel 20. Because I remember yep. USA used to be Channel 19. BT mm-hmm. used to be Channel 20, 20. And Disney Channel used to be G5 Channel 1. But I only saw that when it was free preview weekend because no, nobody paying those yep. premium prices for Disney exactly. Channel. Exactly. And if I'm not mistaken, I think MTV was 21 or 22 because I think they were like right there together. Mm, I'm trying to think. Uh, I think it was BT, MTV, MTV2, VH1, and was it CMT, the country music TV show? Mm-hmm. Yeah, C- CMT. Yeah, all, all of that was on there. So this was right around when cable was still not really brand new, but some areas were still getting adjusted to cable. So a lot of channels weren't made available. So that's why a lot of folks in most rural areas had to go with satellite so that you could get more channels. And you also got to see West Coast feeds of certain networks. So if you were really smart, what you would do was you would watch the East Coast feed of one game show, then yeah. turn around and watch the West Coast feed and get all the answers right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Try to try to <laughs> run a game, game within the game. Now, the funny thing you mentioned earlier, you mentioned uh, Camelot Music and how record stores is pretty much a thing of the past, but seeing how vinyl has gone up in sales and the younger generation are looking at vinyl records and saying, oh, mm-hmm. this is pretty, pretty cool. Like what we were doing with, you know, eight tracks and a lot of the older mediums of recordings, it seemed like the younger generation, they're definitely taking a strong interest in vinyl. Yes. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think it's amazing, but also strange how uh, things tend to find their way back around. Um, you know, nostalgia is always big, and it's so interesting because funny you said that, my daughter is is actually looking for, looking at vinyls, and she wants a record player. <laughs> hmm. Um, and I was like, you want vinyls? And she said, yeah, dad. She was like, I want vinyls and I want, um, vinyls of, uh, Bruno Mars and Melanie Martinez and Ariana Grande. And if you can find them, I would love to have those. And I'm like, I cannot believe how things have went from digital. And now people are wanting to collect analog in a sense. They want to go back and collect the vinyls. And, um, now when I go into stores, I see, um, people my age and older going in there looking and buying like. Like, of course, you're not going to find the 30 Prince albums on vinyl anymore, but they go in there, they're buying the, the, the greatest hits. Mm-hmm. Um, or they're going there and they're buying, like, uh, movie soundtracks. Like, the mm-hmm. other day, I saw a gentleman going in and he bought uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. He bought one, two, and three all on vinyl. Wow. Wow, that's definitely crazy because if you think about with vinyl, it's almost becoming like a collector's item where a lot of people just buying it and saying like oh i got purple rain on vinyl i got dirty mind on vinyl i got thriller on vinyl but if you put this vinyl album on it's not really going to have that same warmth like the original because of course you're taking trying to take a digital remastering and trying to give it that analog feel whereas if you had the original print vinyl you could definitely tell the warmth in the fullness yeah. of the record because they were using analog technology to make that album. Exactly. And like you said, the remastering, um, basically they're re-recording it into a a cl- much cleaner and clearer sound, but because of the uh, the different frequency that it's recorded in, you can definitely tell the difference in the, like you said, in the warmth of the record. Mm-hmm. Now, you can definitely what... tell the difference in the energy when you listen to it. Mm-hmm. Now, speaking of vinyl, what was your first set of DJ equipment? <laughs> so my first set, I actually got, I want to say my daughter just turned one and my wife actually purchased it for me. 
Um, it was a Christmas gift, and she got me a Pioneer SB3 uh, and a set of Harbinger speakers because I already had the computer and I had the software because I would mess around with it at home. And um, so it was actually a surprise Christmas gift for me. Um, and that's how I kind of got everything started. You know, mm -hmm. it was a, um, uh, uh, what's the word I want to say? It wasn't in your $2,000 equipment, but it, it definitely helped get everything started. And it definitely, you know, took care of business where, and I definitely love and appreciate her for that. Right. So it was the starter kit. Yeah, it was the starter kit. I had an SB3. I already had a Dell laptop that I was using. Um, cause like I said, I, I don't, I'm not really, I, I used to, I used to mess with Serato, but I hate making crates. So I'm more of a virtual DJ user because if I'm looking for a special song, I don't have to scroll through a bunch of crates. I can just type it in virtual. And if I have it on my hard drive, it'll find it and I can pull it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I can, yeah, I can add crates that I've made in Serato to that as well into virtual. Um, so I, but I had that at first, and I was pretty much just using that to DJ along with the speakers she had got me at the time, which were um, a set of, no, speakers I had got at the time, which were a set of Geminis. So I had, you know, I was using just the laptop, um, and I, I had always had a big music collection because I've always, as I uh, went back, as I mentioned earlier, in uh, L uh, middle school, I'm sorry, downloading the records from Napster, from LimeWire, from Kazaa, from Aries. Emu, I mean, I could name them all, man. If I bear need share. to get that record, I was bear share. If I wanted that record, I was going to find a way to get it because, you know, then you couldn't buy just the record online. You literally had to, you could either buy the single if somebody had it or you had to buy the entire album to get a certain record. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so this was I, definitely pre Digiwax and a lot of those listservs where yes. you would get a lot of that stuff coming to you directly through the virtual record pool. Exactly. So fast forward, um, she invested in the SB3 and a set of Harbingers for me from uh, for Christmas, and that kind of helped me really get uh, everything off the ground. Okay. As far as like being going from just private house parties to being able to start doing. Um, you know, more um, corporate style parties. Um, and then from there, I kind of took that in advance. Since so now I have a, a SX3 and my speakers are JBLs. Um, but you can t definitely tell the sound quality difference. Uh, but of course, I still have my hard bingos for backup just in case. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but so now I'm, I, I'm doing corporate events. I'm doing private parties. Um, weddings, receptions, birthday parties, sweet sixteens, um, and definitely a lot of um, proms and just standardized parties that a lot of schools are are having, right. like elementary, middles, and high school. You know, if they want to have like a just a small party on like a Friday afternoon for the kids to have something. Okay. Things of that nature. Yeah. Now with the DJ game, if you're a DJ, you definitely got to know. Who you're going to be DJing for? You definitely cannot make the party your personal jukebox and play what you want because they're paying you to cater to them. So you got to be abreast on what's in and just know who you're DJing for. Exactly, and it tends to um, run tough sometimes. And I'm, I know I was talking to DJs that um, have just started. Uh, guys that have been playing just as long as me. I'm coming up on 10 years, I want to say, next year. Um, and guys that's been playing longer than me. And they all say the same. They're like, you know, I they've had gigs where to this day they can go in and just play. And um, it'll be an instance where, you know, it's not a good gig. Um, and I think the criteria has changed now for what's a good gig and what's a bad gig. Because you can go to a, I want to see you can go to a hookah lounge now or a club and just play and people are just vibing. There's no really body really dancing. You know, they're just vibing. They're singing along to the records. They're, you know, relaxing and just kind of chilling out. And then you can go and play somewhere else the following night and you got a dance floor and the, the dance floor is just packed. Everybody's out there dancing and having a good time. Right. Yeah. Cause I was talking to a few DJ friends of mine and kind of elaborating with what you're saying, how I think nightclub culture 
has changed and how you mentioned when you DJs play a record, depending on what venue they're in, the folks are just sitting, bobbing their heads, singing along, but not really packing out the floor and dancing yeah. and how you and I came up in that same era where I think it was that last era where when you went out to a nightclub, you really got busy on the floor and danced yeah. because it was a lot of records that came out that you knew once they hit, you had to hit the floor, especially when the dreaded snap era was out. Yeah. D4L and the <laughs> franchise boy, boy, franchise boy, boy Soldier Boy. Man. Now, Soldier Boy. No, the John. We don't give Soldier Boy credit. Soldier Boy was viral before viral. Yes. Stop playing with that him. man. Stop right. playing with that man. Stop playing with Big Draco. <laughs> yeah, he still got them bathing apes, too. Yes. Yeah, man. But, you know, Shout those records. Yeah. You know, when BT Hip Hop Awards, not to cut you off, but I was saying, you know, the BT Hip Hop Awards, um, this year they did a tribute to hip hop and they broke it up based on regions. And mm -hmm. Atlanta, they had their set where they did a lot of those snap records. And while I hated them at the time, I appreciate them now because it was fun, it was simple, and it got people dancing. Yes, definitely. Um, and back to and yeah, what I was saying, I didn't mean to try to cut across you, forgive me. Um I still go to to this day, I still go to elementary parties and middle school parties. And mind you, these kids are, are under 13 or younger. And they want me to play crank that soldier boy. And they know the dance. <laughs> yeah, because if you think about it, if Soldier Boy had TikTok. Soldier would be the biggest artist been, in the world right bigger. now. Soldier would be big, biggest. Soldier would be where Drake is right now. Mm, yeah, Soldier Boy was definitely ahead of the curve, and like I said, I felt the same way about Little Brother. How they were ahead of the curve, and they came out right when social media was just in its infancy, and how you know with the Minstrel Show, which it took a minute personally for it to grow on me, but it's up there with with me with the listening. And how mm -hmm. it was a well put together album, great concept, a satire, but it just went over a lot of people's heads because, you know, it was definitely to where it was new. It was new. And also, too, you still had to play that mainstream game, whereas now, because of the internet and different communities, you could just cater to your niche and really yeah. make, make your bones off of that. Speaking of, what was the second single from the Crank That album? Was it Donk or was it Soldier Girl? Uh, that I am not sure of. I know both of them were played heavy in nightclubs. Definitely around yeah. the triad. If you went to Alexander Devereaux's Atlantis Cafe, if you know, you know the Rib Shack. What up, DJ Earn? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, you just think about a sweated out dance floor, long white tees, Mitchell and Ness throwbacks, and then the element comes into the room. And you know when the element comes into the room, it's about time to make your way to that exit because that DJ gonna cough that music. Like, hey, 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 hey. And you know when that happens. You already know what it means. You already know what time it is. Fast as you can. Yeah. Because <laughs> I also remember too, hearing from a lot of people around our area, they would go to Mel Joe's. Yes. Lot. When Mel Joe's was popping. I never went to Mel Joe's. I wasn't out in these streets like that. So can you tell me a little bit about Mel Joe's for those that don't know if you've been to Mel Joe's, then um, let them know. I went once. I went once. And that was like on the end of when they were actually about to close out. I had went with uh some cousins of mine and um it was a vibe like I mean, we had a good time all night. Um I'm trying to remember what records were played. I want to say this was like 05 and 06 when I went, I believe. So did, there was a lot of uh, a lot of hype records when I remember going. I know mm. we didn't stay long, though. Mm. Yeah, because we kind of went and we left. I think we probably stayed like maybe an hour and a half and then we dipped out because we got there late. Mm. You know, you get there late and then you leave early mm. when you kind of see how the, how the, the how it's looking. Mm hmm before the DJ even makes that announcement you were talking about. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so, or yeah. when the lights cut on, that's when you know it's time to go. I heard the boat ride was another spot out of 
out of Rocky Mount. That was definitely frequent a lot, the boat ride. But yes, know, boat ride is fun too, man. And again, um, going back to um playing in the nightclubs, um, playing at parties, whether it's private or public, um, a lot of it, a lot of it really has to do with being able to play for your crowd but having crowd control. You know, mm -hmm. if you not knocking the records, but me personally, I've noticed from a couple of my gigs that I've done that if I play a lot of uh, Little John and Waka Flocka and Biggie and Tupac, if that's all I'm playing for the next hour and a half, I'm probably going to look to expect it to get shut down a little early. Mm -hmm. So what I try to do now is I'll play a little bit of it, the hype, get the crowd hype. Mm -hmm. And then I may go into like some thug R and B music, right? Just to kind of sum it up, <laughs> right? It's definitely a science when coming to musical selection when you are DJing at a club because you don't want to peak too early and play a popular record, get the floor filled, and then everybody scatter back out to their spot. So you gotta pretty much gauge the temperature in the room and know when to play what record, when not to play said record. And just pretty much control the crowd because you are pretty much the conductor while you're in mm -hmm. that DJ booth. That's exactly right. Right. That's and the one exactly thing right. I found. So, yeah, it's a, it's a job. I tell people it's a job. I mean, everybody thinks you're just bringing a computer and speakers and playing music. It's way more to it than that. Like you got, like you said, you got to have crowd control, um, especially with, with birthday parties or receptions. You got to know if they want to play, if you want a certain song played. For the um, for the birthday boy, or the birthday girl, um, weddings and receptions, you gotta know, um, do they want the song? What songs they want played when the groom's coming out, the bride's coming out, any particular ones during the reception? When you're behind the scenes, you 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 learn more. Is in other words, unless you tag along with a DJ that does those things, like if you're trying to break into the business. You, it's all going to be self experienced to learn it. It's all going to be self taught because you're going to be like, oh, okay, well, I know this for the next time, or I know this for the next time. And 10 mm -hmm. years in, I find myself still learning stuff, um, even trying to tag along with other guys that I know just to better my craft as well. And as of next year, I'm going to try to start at least bringing some guys that want to try starting out along with me so they can kind of see, get a behind the scenes look at how things go. So they know it's more than just hitting a button on a controller and playing a song. Right. It's definitely a lot of trial and error because there was an interview that Grandmaster Flash did on Sway in the Morning and he broke down the quick mix theory and how he came up with all of this on his own and it was to where he felt where I'm going to lock myself up in this room and pretty much do it trial and error to where I get it the way that I want it. Because you think about it, a lot of those DJs that was pre-digital, that's what they did. They locked themselves in the room, had those crates full of records, and pretty much just manually taught themselves how to blend, how to mix, how to cut, mm -hmm. how to scratch, how to time your BPMs, and how to really be a true DJ. That's right. And to add on to that statement, when you asked me earlier what artists made me want to start DJing, it wasn't your DJ clues and your DJ case slays and your DJ envies. Um, it was the mixtape DJs like DJ L, DJ Ruckus, uh, DJ Sucks One, um, those guys. I would go to the stockyard, as you mentioned, and I would see those mixtapes there. Because mind you, when I was in high school and I was doing the mixtape thing, the mixtapes I sold was all new music that came out. Like, mm -hmm. I remember Clue dropped the mixtape, and he was the only one that had two records from the Black Album on there before the Black Album dropped. I know one was Change Clothes. I think the other one might have been... Um, what more can I say? That was the other one. Mm -hmm. Clue was the only person that had the two records. So I'm in Rocky Mountain, and I see that. And then I see a couple of more records that had like Gap Band, uh, Earth, Wind & Fire, the Isley Brothers. And then I'm seeing another R&B mixtape that has like Aaliyah, Blackstreet, Total, um, 
God, what's what's my girl? What's my group name? A uh, groove theory. Um, I'm seeing those types of mixtapes. So while I'm picking up the clue tapes, I'm picking these up too. And while I'm vibing, I'm noticing how, you know, they're transitioning the records into the next song. They're blending them. And that is what made me really want to be a DJ at that time. Right. And there's also when other I DJs where they let the music do the talking. And there's others that really are good mic DJs. Now, when you're a mic DJ, you really have to really keep the crowd engaged and know when to keep what you're saying on the mic short and know when to pretty much let the record do the talking for you. Exactly. And we were having a conversation about that the other day, me and some guys, because they were talking about... Matter of fact, I, it's funny you said that because I think it was a podcast or an Instagram live I watched with DJ Earn. I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, I apologize. But I believe it was DJ Earn and two other guys, and they were talking about how um one of the guys mentioned that he he didn't like the mic DJs because they talked more than they played the record. And when they played the record, the record might have lasted maybe a minute, and then they were on to the next record. Mm -hmm. And fast forward to that, me and some of my friends were chit-chatting about that a couple of weeks ago because we were talking about how that style keeps the crowd hyped up. But the con of that is if you're doing an R&B vibe, you can't really talk, do that and talk over records mm -hmm. because there's going to be that point or that certain chorus or that bridge that's going to hit that the crowd is going to want to sing and then you're cutting it off and going to the next record. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I found that being my biggest complaint with a lot of mic with, with the mic DJs, not yeah. knocking them because I love that they keep the crowd hype. You know, if I'm in an arena or a um or a party or something, and I hear and I hear him talking, and he's going to the next record, he's talking, he's going to the next record. I'm like, okay, let's go, keep it going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, you definitely uh -huh. gotta know what's high, what's high energy, and what bring that because you can't be have high energy like like your fat man scoop when you're doing a R and B set. But exactly you got, like you said, you gotta know you know what songs are being played. You gotta know when to drop the vocals out so that the crowd can sing along, so you can get audience mm -hmm. participation, and then really hype them up because I know. When some DJs do old school sets, I know Poison is one of those records that when the DJ drops it, it the floor comes immediately, especially if it's like a 30 plus old school grown and sexy yeah, set. Yeah. That's definitely one of those records where you're gonna get people on the floor singing along and just really having a vibe. But a lot of the younger kids, younger generation. I'm surprised that some of them how they're like, oh, I want to hear this record. I want to hear this record. I'm like, you were born in early 2000s. I was in college when you right. were born. You're making me feel <laughs> old you know right record? now. How do you know this record? <laughs> it's amazing, man, how it transitioned like that. And back to that statement, I, I noticed that a lot of the uh, 30 and under crowd um, like the Mike DJs a little bit better. And, and that's mainly because I want to say the majority of their um, gigs are usually um, type, more hype records. Like um, when I went, because I have a cousin that goes to some of those and I may ride with him just to check the DJ out. And some of those um, type of events, you know, the, the, the person is usually playing um, some Money Bag, Yo, some King Von, some Lil Dirt. Some little baby, uh, da baby, uh, sweetie, uh, sexy red, um, and I find myself playing a lot of that too, but I don't find myself doing a lot of the um, mic talking as they do when they do it because it's like they're, they they play the song, they go to talking on the mic, and then they switch it, and the crowd is hype, and it, and it and it's fun, um, but going back to that, it's definitely is that type of vibe really is only going to work if you're doing straight hip hop and rap off. Right. Now, would you say your style of DJing, are you more of a mixer, blender, or would you say you're more of like your tech DJ where you're doing a lot of cutting, scratching, and mixing? 
I'm 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 more of a mixer blender with a bit of cutting. I don't do a lot of scratching at all. Um, only because I haven't really had the time or any DJs I know that I could shadow that does it a lot so I can learn it. Um, I find myself being more of a hands-on learner than um a video learner from making sense. So I would mm -hmm. literally have to sit back and watch, see somebody do it, and then I could do it myself. But uh, as far as mixing and blending and cutting, um, that's usually what I normally do. Um, when I started messing around with the computer equipment, that was what I would do. I would do a lot of cutting with the records first. Um, you know, I'll let a song play maybe like two, two and a half minutes in, and then I'm like, okay, we can, I'm, I'm going to get ready to switch it to the next one. Then I'm going to switch it to the next one. And then later on, as I started doing more gigs, I find myself trying out different blends as I was going along. So that definitely comes in handy, too, especially when you're trying to transition a record into another one. And they pretty much have like the same tempo, in a sense, mm -hmm. same beats per minute. That definitely helps out. Right. And you definitely got to know when to play your sound effects, when not to play it, when to do your delays, your flares, your echoes on certain mm -hmm. records because if you do it too much the crowd could kind of get tuned out by that exactly that's exactly right and sometimes man you don't even have to play any of it sometimes if you got like a a, a 35 plus crowd they don't want they don't care for the sound effects they don't care for the, the you talking on the mic all night a lot of them just want to vibe out here getting music yeah so, so it definitely going lounge. back to what you said it goes back to what you it goes back to your statement about knowing your crowd yeah, because typically that 35 and up crowd, you know, we just came off of a long, hard work week. We just want to lounge <laughs> out. We want to have a nice little drink and get our two-step on. Exactly. Yeah, with exactly. the hard bottoms, of course. Piggybacking off a question that you asked way earlier, what's your favorite Jay-Z record? Mm, my favorite Jay-Z record it is, for me, it would probably have to be Hard Knocks Life. Okay. What's your favorite Jay-Z feature? Favorite Jay Z feature for me, it would have to be um, "Can I Get Open" uh, with Original Flavor. Original Flavor. Mine's is uh, "Go Crazy." <laughs> go 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 crazy now. Jeezy. Now, yeah, oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> that doing Snowman Jeezy. My God, kids. Props Kids. to him too for putting out two two uh, solid albums in the past three years too. Kids, for the mixtape and the album in the past year and yeah. a half. I'm sorry. Yeah. Kids, I want to say this: if you don't know Snowman Jeezy, go get that Snowfall album. Get Snowfall. Get those early Jeezy records. Get those DJ Drama Gangsta Brazils mixtapes. Exactly. I'm Good luck find the snowman time. shirt too when we couldn't wear him to school. Yeah, you could yeah, they had to ban the <laughs> snowman because once the administrators found out what the snowman meant, it wasn't talking Woo! about frosty evil. Right. We ain't talking about frosty. No, <laughs> no, no. P and J and Samuel Powell Dairy Roads, uh Southwell to some of them spots, they were uh moving keys, not car keys either. No, definitely if, not car keys. If if if, if 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 you know what I mean, but you know, Jeezy, when he first came out, man, it was where, you know, especially those DJ Drama Gangster Grill mixtapes, it was to where everybody really had to take notice and really pay attention to, to that movement that, that was coming with Jeezy. Yes. Yes. And um, it's ridiculous, man, because I remember that. And and it's crazy because I think, I think, I would probably say 85% of the people, unless you were from Atlanta, your first time hearing Jeezy was so icy. Yep, that was mine. And to hear that record being Gucci's record, but Jeezy, it pays attention when you have a person on your record and they, not knocking Gucci, shout out to Gucci, love Gucci. But when you have a single that drops and the person on your single tends to grasp more attention than you do, that kind of lets people know, like, okay, we got something special here. Mm. You know, you're like, oh, okay, this, this person might have something. So, and their their styles of flows on that record were, like, 
completely different. But I think it was the raspy voice mm -hmm. with the lyricism. Because at that time, I think we only really had one rapper that had that raspy voice that, that sounded like that. That was Jada Kiss. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, speaking of Jada, Jada went Kobe 81 on that versus battle with Locks and Dipset. I oh, mean, God. I mean, he's like, just give me the ball and let me cook. And cook he did. I'm outside. Come see me. This is Kiss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this man, he literally just... Woo, that was a master class. And if you remember back in the day too, when he did the commercial for Reeboks with the Allen Iverson shoes and yeah. how, you know, he pretty much made everybody want to go to Champs, Foot Locker, Foot Action, did to get those AIs. And of course, AI had, had bars too. So much yeah. so that uh, David Stern banned that Jules album. Yeah, man. Sucks he did that. I think I have a couple of records around here somewhere from that album. Uh, from the Jewels album? Yeah, from the Jewels. I think I got like four or five of them. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of people also want to hate on that uh that, that Shaq rap album, but Shaq Shaq had some some bangers on the album, had some banging production by man, Alicia Shaq went Muhammad, platinum, man. Shaq called Quest. I mean, like you said, it went it went platinum. So um hate on them if you want. Shaq is making money while why you sleep. And Can't Stop the Rain is still one of my favorite records to this day, man. Oh yeah. And the biggie. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Oh. De definitely got that record. I'm still waiting on to get the collaboration from Dame Dollar and have Victor Oladipo on the hook. Oh, I did not know they were doing that. No, 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 no. They're not doing oh, that. Oh, that's the weird. It would be here. dope, you know, if that were to happen because you know Dame is a legitimate spitter. Yeah, yeah. He, he Speaking legit. of Dame, you know, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think Dame is on the bonus track on the Collie Grove Two album. The two chains on the way. Okay. I think well, Dame is on the bonus track, the very last track on that album. Word up. And then another person who I feel now and is getting their flowers are being appreciated more, but because of the whole thing with Autotune, we're overlooking how brilliant of a songwriter and producer T Pain is. Hey, finally, man, finally. So I'm sure you tuned in the Soul Train the other night and seen that he finally got his flowers in. Mm. Perform like 40 hits in like 10 minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, cause I mean, when I first heard I'm Sprung, I didn't like it because for me, it was like, what is this? But, you know, once his other records started coming out, I'm in love with a stripper. I can't believe it. Buy you a drink, bartender. I mean, you can't deny the man this knows how on, to man. produce and write a hit. And believe it or not, I actually hear I'm in love with a stripper before I hear it I'm sprung. Because I had I had I had got bought this mixtape online and it said T Paint, I'm in love with a dancer. Mm -hmm. And there's no Mike Jones verse on it. Mm -hmm. It's strictly three verses from T Paint. Mm -hmm. And because you know when you hear the I'm in love with a stripper and you hear um Mike Jones rap, mm -hmm. and then T Paint starts singing as soon as his verse cuts off. Mm -hmm. The original one where Mike Jones starts rapping is literally where the third verse starts. Mm -hmm. So it's way shorter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's funny, you know, not funny, but how looking at now, a lot of the music that we grew up listening to would be problematic now because of yes. all of the issues going on now and the internet and Cancel culture, I mean, if you look at Ronnie's verse in Do Me by BBD, that verse would be yeah. problematic today. Backstage, underage, adolescence, nope. Definitely can't do that. Uh, yep. Just can't handle it by high five. Can't can't do that once talking about I'm only 16, she was 25. And then, of course, now with the most recent, you know, alle not allegations, but Gloria Velez came out was talking about how grooming starts in the mu music industry. Um, she had mentioned Uncle Luke's name, and Uncle Luke did a rebuttal. But um, knowing, you know, with Gloria Velez being with Aaron Hall, when you go back and listen to "Don't Be Afraid," that record, you know, you can't listen to it the same way you did 
back when it first came out, knowing exactly. Situation. And it's like I tell people, I don't condone anything people did in the past, especially if they knew it was wrong. Mm. Um, but you know, you can't change the past and you can't change history. And it was just like when Eminem used to say the um what's the word I want, I want to say it correctly, the F word that's offensive to the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was acceptable because he was not referring to the community. He was calling somebody else. And in my opinion, it's, it, it's not acceptable at all to call anybody that, period. Mm -hmm. But during that time period, that was like a norm. Right. You know, it was just like back like back when my mom and dad were younger, it was nothing for a a 30-year-old to go back to, to try to court a 16-year-old. Mm -hmm. As long as the parents were okay with it. Fast right. forward today, we're in 2023, going to 2024, and we still have that happening. Like, we still have um, older guys or older girls trying to court younger, you know, teenagers. And they may try to do it on the low or they have they've probably been watching him ever since they were teenagers and waited until they got in their twenties to reach out to him. But you know, it still happens. Yeah, because you know, you remember back in the day, you know, when you know some of those guys would, would come up come up to the school and you know, pick pick some pick some girls up. I yeah, mean, pick the know. girls up in the car. They're 19, yeah. 20 years old, and they come and picking up 15 to 16 year olds and they're getting in the car and they're like, Oh, that's what such and such and you know, they're bragging about it, and then you're looking like, no, I don't think you should be doing nah, that. <laughs> nah, nah, that's definitely, you know, not cool, something, you know, not 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 to be condoning. And then of course, I'm I'm glad now that because of you know surviving R. Kelly and everybody knowing what we know now than what we should have did yes. then, that you know, he's put away for what he did and how yeah. you know I can't even listen to his music anymore personally for me. Gotcha. Me, I'm on the fence. I can listen to his music, but I don't condone what he did. But that's only because I learned and I learned that a couple of years ago because remember when the rumors were going around about Michael Jackson? Mm -hmm. And even though now they're coming out saying none of those were true, mm -hmm. at that time I still had to learn to separate the art from the person. Right. You know, and being a big music lover, it's like, and it's crazy because I was watching the Drink Champs interview and Tank was on it. Mm -hmm. And Tank was like, he was saying pretty much what we were saying. Like, he was like, I don't condone anything he did. Right. He was like, but in music, just talking about music alone, mm -hmm. that man's that man's the greatest of all time. He used the ball. He was mm -hmm. like, you, 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 you could probably try to erase Michael if you wanted to. You can't erase R. Kelly. Right. He just got so much, so many songs that he's written for other people. Like, if you was to go and take all of R. Kelly's four, I think it's fourteen or thirteen albums off the internet right now, where you couldn't even access. Mm -hmm. Good luck getting rid of all the other records that he's written for other people. Right. Right. So can't, de can't deny the producing and songwriting talent but can't deny you know, the music side but like I, I agree with you on the other end like and and I'm in a DJ group and we talk about that from time to time mm -hmm. and this this girl that shout out to DJ Rachel she's up in Connecticut and she made a valid point she said if you have any questions or if you're big on playing R. Kelly music this is what you should do you need to discuss that with the person that booking you for the event mm -hmm. if they request you to play r kelly which i and i understand what she's saying because i've had events what i did for older birthday parties mm -hmm. like people that are in their 50s or 60s mm -hmm. and they want to hear like backyard party or step in the name of love mm -hmm. so she said if I, I i me she was like me personally i wouldn't condone playing it but if you're playing if you're booking a party if you're playing a party for someone and the person that's booking you requests it mm -hmm. then there shouldn't be a problem with you playing that record mm. because that person is the one that the person that booked you asked you to play that record. So if somebody has an issue, they need to take it up with that person. Mm. Take it up with the promoter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The promoter. Yeah. Or even, or even the person, like if I'm doing a birthday party mm. 
And the person who booked the birthday party come out, hey, like I had a gentleman that turned 62. Right. And his daughter was the one that booked the party. She came up and she was like, hey, dad wants to hear Step in the Name of Love. Okay, mm -hmm. you got it. Right, right. And speaking of promoters, have you ever had a, uh, let's just say a John Doe, janky promoter story? I ain't saying no names as far as promoters <laughs> or nothing like that. Have you ever been in a situation where, let's just call this promoter, John Doe Promotions, uh, did a janky promoters on you? Well, here's the thing. Um, one thing about me and my my dad and my uncle taught me at an early age to be smart with business. So I never really had a janky promoter story because I always make sure I get paid before the event. Mm -hmm. I don't do pay me at the door, pay me when I arrive. You pay me in advance. I send you an invoice or a contract. You got your paperwork. And the reason I do that is because it's easier for me to give you a refund than it is for me to get my money from you. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, kind so, of. But, some but back to that, I think the only thing I did that was close to it is that we did a gig. Um, me and two other guys did a gig, um, together down in um, I want to say Rocky Mount one time, and um, we were supposed to get paid based on the turnout, mm -hmm. and they didn't really have a big turnout, mm -hmm. like a door deal in a sense. Yeah, yeah. So that was probably the only one that's probably been like maybe six, seven years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, and then, so at that time I always learned and I mean I knew then, but that was like that, okay, this is what you have to do from now on. Mm -hmm. You know, now now you know you're gonna have to get your money at least up front when you arrive. So fast forward a couple of years later, we had some incidents where I would have people call me and they would be like, Hey, I'm gonna pay you even though we couldn't do the event because I still have to pay you for your time. Um, we've had it where um, I've had it where I've had people say, I'm going to pay you the day of and we get there and they're like, you know, I got, I got, I only got half your money. I'm going to give you the rest at, at the end of the night. Um, and not, like I said, not really a promoter, but more a sense of like, these were like people that would be like, okay, I want you to do such and such private party, mm -hmm. like private yard party, birthday party, blah, blah, blah. So mm -hmm. after then, I pretty much have resorted all my stuff to where, regardless of who the person is, um, we're either doing a contract or we're doing an invoice. Mm -hmm. And all invoices are expected to be paid at least. To, now, if they're paying with a check, like if it's a company event, like for a school um, or a community event, um, like to say, like a, a club might be doing something. Mm. Um, then I will do the option of them doing either a contract, and they can pay me the day of, since it'll be in the form of a check. Right. Um, because I'm pretty sure I'm pretty much certain that they're gonna have the funds ready for me when I arrive. Right. Um, but when it comes to like weddings and private parties and stuff like that, I always do it a week in advance. Um, I send them an invoice. I write off saying that it's paid. Um, they pay me in advance, and then you know. If something happens where, like, if I have an emergency and I can't come, mm -hmm. um, or they have an emergency, hey, we had to cancel off the party, I could just go, go to them, give them the money back, if if needed, case closed. But, of course, mm -hmm. that depends on the situation, too, because if it's same day, ain't really much I can do about it. And that's what most DJs do now, because, you know, it's like you paid me for the date, now we're the day of, and you're canceling. You know, I could have used this date for somebody else. Right. Because people, the, the one thing I've learned, and the, I don't think this is ever going to change, it would be the same way as if um, you were a public speaker for your podcast. Let's mm -hmm. say you took your podcast on the road and people are like, well, hey, um, how much um, is there? And you were like, yeah, well, I'll come bring my podcast to your school and we'll chit chat. I'm going to bring my podcast to your community and we'll talk, you know, go over some topics and conversations but this is my fee. People don't really understand that this part, that it could, that it's your business in a sense, if I'm making sense. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't like to treat it as if, so, the majority of the people do, but you have your few that go like, oh man, you, you, you know, you got your little DJ gig. This is how much you're charging or I can't believe you're doing business like this, but I mean, it's, if you go to McDonald's and they don't and they put ketchup on your burger, do you go to McDonald's and ask for your money back? Nope. You ask for another burger. They're not gonna give you your money back and they're not gonna take the food. Right. 
So, you know, you got to have you got to have proper etiquette in business sense when you're working with different people. Um, and that's not just DJing, you know, that can come with um, if you are a fashion designer, if you design your own clothes and masks and cups and stuff like that, you know, you got to be able to stand on business both ways. Um, I know a lot of I've seen a lot of barbers and um, hairstylists actually get a lot stricter with their stuff with that, too. Um, and man, a lot of them don't want do won't do refunds at all. If you if you book the deposit, the deposit is automatically non refundable. Mm -hmm. So, because you're paying for that time that somebody else could have gotten. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you are no show for your appointment, then it's like I said, some do non refundable where they're still going to get that money. Now, some may require a deposit up front to secure the DJ for the event. Now, clients, if you are booking DJs, I'm going to tell you a little secret that will save you some heartache and some time. And you probably know where I'm going with this. So let mm -hmm. me tell you for the clients. Don't shop above your budget. i say it again. Do not oh, shop yeah. above your budget. Get what you can afford. Don't try to be like, uh, can you come down on this? I'm like, no, this is how I eat. This is like the trail speedwell. I got to feed my family. So I can maybe refer you to some DJs that's within your budgets, but I'm not going to come down on my price. Right. And that's, and I'm pretty reasonable with people. Like I'm willing to work with people, but I can't like, and I, I hate to put it out there, but I mean, I, I find guys that will go and they will play from like, they'll start a party at seven. They'll play to like two or three o'clock in the morning and they're getting like 200 and $250. Huh? Say what not? And I'm like, dude, I'm like, dude, you killing yourself no. for no reason. No, no reason at all. Like, and I'm like, but what makes it worse is that if you go that low and you're going to do that, and then let's say that person or they referred you to someone and like, hey, can you do such and such? And let's say you're already booked for an event or you're like, or you got an emergency, something going on where you can't do it. You may refer them to another DJ, and that DJ may not charge what you're charging. And then that causes a bigger conflict with mm -hmm. the person trying to find someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so don't play yourself. Don't lowball yourself. I mean, like I said, it's your business. It's your livelihood. Now, I know some folks, if it's for like a charity event or something like that for the kids, then maybe you'll do like a special rate for yeah. communities, schools, or something like that, maybe waive some type of fee since it is for like charity or nonprofit. But if it's for profit, don't lower your standards. Don't lowball. Definitely don't do it for a free piece wing dinner or whatever's left over at the club by the end of the night in the drink. And I would tell you, and if there's any DJs that's going to be watching this podcast, please avoid the promotion tactic that they try to use for exposure because exposure does not pay your bills exposure does not feed your family if you want to donate your time to someone you know personally out of the goodness of your heart that's completely different than um somebody calling you for a random gig and wanting you to do it for free for a bunch of people because they don't want to pay because guess what they've paid for the building they've paid for the food they've paid for the decorations so they can pay for the entertainment because that is the most important part of the event and this public service announcement was brought to you by dj j rich and beyond the album cover the more you know <laughs> so before we go bro um do you have any shouts you want to give also give your website for where folks can book you for djing events um, I'm working on my website right now, but you can find me on Facebook by my name. Uh, if you look up Jordan, I'll come right up. No last name. Um, if you want to find me on uh, TikTok, Instagram, um, Snapchat, uh, um, the tag is Driftless Nights. Um, that's D is in David, R-I-F-T is in Tom, L-E-S-S-N-I-G-H-T-S, -S -S, Driftless Nights. That was actually my uh, gamer tag, and it ended up becoming my username for a lot of um those platforms for instagram and snapchat and tiktok made it a little easier so um definitely find me at that 
If you want to reach me by email, uh, email is also the same, driftlessnights at gmail.com. That's the easiest way to reach me out, reach out to me for bookings. Um, once I get the website up and running, um, I'll definitely let you know, uh, Jerome, when it comes up. All right. And you definitely have his money like Rihanna said that that lady of the night <laughs> better have her money. And you can Not catch this interview me. wherever you stream and also on youtube.com slash beyond the album cover. Once again, let's give a big round of applause. A big thank you for my bro, DJ J. Rich, for coming on to Beyond the Album Cover. J. Rich, thank you for coming on, man. Looking forward to having you back on again. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I enjoyed the chat with you, Jarrell, and uh, we'll link up soon, man. Believe yes, it or not, sir. if we can touch bases pretty soon, if you want to do a part two of this, we can. Yeah. Um, I got a, I got a couple people I know that may be interested in joining your podcast okay. as well to chop it up about music. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, for sure. We'll, um, we'll, yeah, we'll speak on that for sure. 